Fly High, the story of Bessie Coleman by Louise Borden and Mary Kay Kroger, illustrated by Teresa Flavin. Early years. A hundred years ago in Waxahachie, Texas, Bessie Coleman walked four miles to her one-room schoolhouse and four miles home. Bessie loved numbers, and learning numbers was worth walking those long, dusty miles past tenant farms and cotton fields and small, shabby houses. Bessie Coleman was a reader, too. Twice a year, a library wagon stopped in front of her small home on Palmer Road. And twice a year, Bessie's mother, Susan Coleman, used her ironing money to rent books for Bessie to read. Books about people whose skin was the color of Bessie's. People like Harriet Tubman and Booker T. Washington. They were somebody, all right. Susan Coleman had been just 10 years old when the Civil War ended. The daughter of Georgia's slaves, she couldn't read or write, but she had a big heart and spoke with kind words. Susan knew how to plant seeds, pick cotton, and teach her children to love God. Bessie's father, George, who was part Indian, couldn't read or write either. The Colemans had 13 children, and Bessie was the 10th child born into this big family. Four of the Coleman children died at early ages. Even so, Susan kept her strong faith in the Lord. When Bessie was nine years old, her father left his family behind and headed for Oklahoma. Maybe tribal lands and customs would bring him a better life than a Texas cotton town. Now, times in Waxahachie were even harder for Susan Coleman and the youngest children still at home. But Susan had her Bible. Every night, Bessie read aloud to her mother and her three little sisters, slowly then faster as she got better with the Lord's words. School was where Bessie wanted to be, not dragging a picker's sack through the cotton fields of Texas. But in August and September, when the green cotton balls split open fluffy white, Bessie couldn't go to school. It was time to pick cotton. Some years, her school doors were shut until November or December. Cotton picking mattered more to the town than numbers and books. Every hand was needed. And for poor folks like the Colemans, heavy sacks of cotton meant food on the supper table. Many times at the end of those long days, Bessie stood next to the head foreman checking his numbers. She wanted to make sure that the cotton her family had picked was weighed fair and square. Susan Coleman had a proud smile when she saw her Bessie write down those numbers and figure out the sums. Someday, that girl would be somebody. From the start, Bessie Coleman had always been a walker and a counter. Now, as she grew older, Bessie was a dreamer. On Saturdays, Bessie walked five miles across the streets of Waxahachie, taking clean shirts to the big houses of folks who had money. And Bessie walked five miles home to her sisters and her mom with another sack of laundry to wash and press. Maybe if she saved enough ironing money, she could get a better education. Beyond the skimpy eight grades in that one-room schoolhouse, with more schooling, she could be somebody. Several years later, at the age of 18, Bessie took catch-up classes at a university in Oklahoma. This was the colored agriculture in normal university. The students there in Langston had dark skin too. Bessie was placed in the sixth grade, but the classes cost too much for a country girl. After only one term, Bessie had to come back home to the three-room house on Palmer Road. Chicago years. Chicago, head north. There are jobs for all. Lots of folks from the South heard those words. Maybe Walter, an older brother, could help Bessie find a bigger life there. Walter was somebody. He had moved to Chicago years before when Bessie was little. Now Walter was a fine Pullman porter. It was Bessie's time to try again. She was 23 years old when she moved to Chicago. The year was 1915, a busy time for the big, big city up north. Chicago had tall buildings and trains and streetcars. The wide sidewalks were full of talk and news. Chicago had the wind off Lake Michigan 
and deep winter snows and was miles away from the dirt floor cabin where Bessie had been born. In Chicago, you could be somebody. Now Bessie needed a job. There were many barber shops in South Chicago and most of them had a manicurist. Bessie knew she could learn how to trim and file nails. It was a lot easier than picking cotton. If she were fast at it, she could make good money. And that's just what Bessie did. First, she worked in a shop on State Street. Then she moved to Duncan's Barber Shop on East 36th. While Bessie clipped and filed nails, she listened to Chicago baseball talk and the deep voices and stories of men. Big city life was new, and it was fun. Bessie was still a reader. Every day, she read the pages of the Chicago Defender, a newspaper for her people, published by Robert Abbott. Robert Abbott was somebody, and his work was news. Bessie wrote letters of her life in Chicago back to Texas. Soon, the rest of the Coleman family moved north to the big, windy city. In the fall of 1919, Duncan's was abuzz with the stories of soldiers who had fought in the trenches of France. Bessie's brothers, Walter and John, had served in that war, too. Now they were back in Chicago, home safe and sound from the battles of World War I. Bessie Coleman was a good listener. As she filed and buffed her customers' nails near the front window of the shop, Bessie heard tales of French women who could fly airplanes. John Coleman told Bessie, those French lady pilots, they are somebody. Off to France. From then on, Bessie wanted to fly. The pilots and aviators in Abbott's Chicago Defender led exciting lives. If they could learn to fly, so could she. All she needed was a good teacher. But Bessie was a woman, a woman with dark skin, and she didn't have much money. The only pilots in Chicago were men, white men. Not one of them would teach her to fly a plane. But Bessie Coleman, who had walked four miles to school and back to learn her numbers, who had walked five miles and back to earn money, didn't give up her plan to learn how to fly. Someday, she would be a somebody on Chicago's south side. Robert Abbott would know a teacher. Robert Abbott was the man to see. You can learn to fly in France, Abbott told Bessie. If you earn some money and learn to speak French, then I'll help you find a flying school. Bessie worked and saved and saved and worked. One day, she placed a toy airplane made by a neighborhood boy in the window of Duncan's barbershop. Bessie Coleman told herself, Someday, I'll be a pilot. Small step by small step. To make better wages, Bessie left the barber shop to work in a chili restaurant. Now that she had more money to put in the bank, Bessie signed up to take French classes on Michigan Avenue. Bonjour, au revoir, c'est la vie. Bessie said the new French words over and over in her kitchen as she cooked for her nieces and nephews. She was the favorite aunt who let them play records on her wind-up Victrola. She even gave them money for movies. Young Arthur and Marion and the other Coleman cousins thought their Aunt Bessie was the best aunt in town. On a November day in 1920, Bessie boarded the SS Imperator from a New York City pier and sailed for France. She had her passport in her pocket and some money from her friend Robert Abbott. Bessie Coleman was 28 years old. In a small town near the Somme River, two Frenchmen ran a famous flying school. Yes, they would teach Bessie how to fly. For seven months in a country far from the cotton fields of Texas, Bessie walked nine miles to the airfield and nine miles home to the village of Rue. She had no friends to help her, no family, but she wanted to learn to fly. And fly she did, just like the pilots in the news stories of the Chicago Defender, just like the pilots in the United States who were men and who were white, Bessie Coleman learned the same skills that they knew with courage in her heart. Now Bessie knew all the words, in French and in English, for the parts of the small plane she was learning to fly. 
cockpit, rudder bar, stick, and struts. She heard the stories about other pilots who crashed their fragile planes, who sometimes lost their lives. But still, she kept walking those long miles to the airfield, nine miles to her French biplane, whose wings were made of cloth, and nine miles back to her room in Rue. She would fly high and be somebody and tell others of her race that they could do the same thing too. On June 15th, 1921, Bessie Coleman put an important piece of paper in her pocket, an international license to fly. It was the very best license to have. With it, Bessie could fly anywhere in the world. Nobody could say, you're a Negro woman, you can't fly. Bessie then headed to Paris and bought a fancy leather coat. Now she was an aviatrix, a trace chic, aviatrix. Back home in the USA. That September, Bessie Coleman sailed back to New York Harbor. Now she was news, front page news. African-American newspapers all over the country had stories about the first person of their race to learn to fly. Always waving, always smiling, Bessie Coleman was an aviatrix with spunk and style. Eager to improve her flying skills for future air shows, Bessie returned to Europe the next February. For six months, she took more lessons in France, Germany, and Holland. Tailspins, banking turns, figure eights, looping the loop. Then she came home to the U.S. to perform all those daring stunts. Her first air show was on Long Island on September 3rd, 1922, and Brave Bess was a hit. Bessie drew big crowds whenever she flew. Petite and pretty, even in a leather helmet and goggles, Bessie wore tall, shiny boots and, of course, her long coat from Paris. In Texas, in Tennessee, in New York, in Illinois, Bessie Coleman told her many fans, all of us are created equal. If others of her race weren't allowed to buy tickets for the air shows, then Bessie refused to fly. Bessie Coleman was a thinker and a talker. She visited dozens of black schools and churches in many states. You can be somebody. You can fly high, just like me. Now Bessie wanted to help other people. She wanted to open a flying school so that others could learn to fly. Not everything was easy for Bessie. Money was still a problem. It was hard to make money flying, and Bessie had to borrow planes to fly in. Finally, Bessie was able to buy her own plane. Her Jenny was a biplane. It wasn't new. It was old and shabby, but it was hers. Then Bessie was in a terrible crash in California. Shortly after takeoff from Santa Monica, the Jenny's motor stalled. In the 1920s, engine failure after takeoff was a common occurrence. The crash of Bessie's plane was the fourth such crash in the Los Angeles area in less than a month. And she nosedived to the ground. Bessie was in the hospital for three long months and didn't fly for a year. With the loss of her own Jenny, Bessie again had to borrow planes for her air shows. Most of the planes were old and not very safe. Bessie knew that flying was a risk, but she thought it was an important risk to take on behalf of her race. A sad ending. On April 29, 1926, Bessie Coleman was in Jacksonville, Florida, hundreds of miles away from Waxahachie and hundreds more away from Chicago. She was 34 years old and close to her dream of opening a flying school. That day, Bessie visited every African-American school in the city. She told young people her story. She told them, you can do something with your life too. Many of Bessie's fans had tickets for her air show on May 1st. Even her friend Robert Abbott happened to be in town, and when Bessie saw him in a restaurant, she thanked her friend for giving her the chance to fly. 
The day before Bessie was to fly high for the Jacksonville crowd, she and a Texas mechanic, William Wills, were to take a test run in the old shabby plane that Bessie was to use. That morning, Bessie knelt by her plane and said a quiet prayer. Then she let Wills take the controls while she sat in the rear seat. Bessie was a safe pilot, but this time she didn't fasten her seatbelt. She wanted to get a better view of the land below. Suddenly, something was wrong. The plane went into a tailspin. Bessie fell from her plane, down, down, thousands of feet. William Wills died too, after the plane crashed on the ground. No one could believe the awful news. Brave Bess, who had come so many miles from the cotton fields of Texas, would never be able to fly again, would never be able to tell others, you can be somebody too. Goodbye to Brave Bess. In Jacksonville, 5,000 people, many of whom had heard Bessie's inspiring words, came to the memorial service to say goodbye. Then Bessie's casket went to Chicago on a train. Up and down State Street, there were prayers and tears. A formal funeral was held at the Pilgrim Baptist Church in the big, big city whose streets Bessie called home. 10,000 people passed by her coffin to pay their respects. They would never forget that their Bessie Coleman had shown the world how anyone could fly high. Their Bessie was somebody, all right. Daughter, aunt, walker, reader, dreamer, thinker, student, pilot, speaker, teacher. Bessie Coleman was all of these. Like her mother, Susan, Bessie knew how to plant seeds. Her work in schools and churches was as important as her daring spins and loops in the sky. Across the U.S., some of Bessie's young fans grew up to be pilots. Many others would remember her courage, her smile, and her words. You can do something, too. Keep trying. Fly high.